Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our, our, uh, our first uh, Walter Stern Library Improve Your Life series. It's the first one we've had like this. I'm Kurt Asher. I'm Dean of the Library. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to tell you about a couple other things. Um, on October 25th at 1230, we'll have another event like this called De-Stress Your Distress. And we'll be bringing in uh, a therapist and mindfulness expert, uh, Yasinika Avan Avansena. She's, uh, uh, she's going to teach a practical mindfulness meditation workshop and talk about its practical applications in the real world for stress reduction, improved concentration and focus, and overall improvement in well-being. Um, and then I also hope that you'll be able to join us um, for the, with documentary filmmaker Dana Glazer on uh, September uh, 26th at 6 for his film, The uh, Evolution of Dad. We're going to have a screening of that film here in the library. And that examines uh, the evolution of fatherhood and it'll likely and how fatherhood will likely change over the course of time. We have 10 other events planned for the semester, including a debate between uh, District 4 County Supervisor candidates on October 10th at 6, and a Kegley Institute of Ethics discussion. It's, uh, it's, a, co it's a collaboration between uh, the uh, Institute of Ethics and the library on marijuana policy in Kern County. So I hope you can attend all those events and uh, because they're all gonna be very interesting and they're going to be very engaging. So. Now to today's speaker, uh, before I get going, though, I wanted to thank Better Bowls. They're the people who are providing us with the food and it's pretty good, right? Yeah. <laughs> they, uh, they donated half the food, so they've, they've uh, been a, uh, a nice partner for this event. So uh, we really appreciate it. Um, now to, a little bit about, uh, our t today's speaker, I became acquainted with Dr. Ha uh, a couple of years ago um, and all his efforts to bring change to the community's health through diet. And uh, he's going to present evidence that better health is, is achievable through a whole food, plant based approach to nutrition. It can help you lose weight, it can uh, help with. Uh, even eliminate prescription medicines and reverse chronic conditions like high blood pressure and diabetes. So um, I've heard testimony from people that have had that at, at some of Dr. Ha's workshops. So I'm, I, I know uh, that. Um, he's a family uh, physician with Kaiser Permanente Kern County. For over 10 years, he's led local efforts to pr improve uh, clinical quality care and chronic disease management and health education for members, including healthy lifestyle and weight management programs. He's a Kern, uh, a Kaiser Permanente Kern County's area physician for marketing and government relations. He earned a Bachelor of Science degree in biology and psychology at Duke University and a Doctor of Medicine uh, degree at East Carolina School of Medicine. He completed his uh, family medicine residency at Long Beach Memorial and he joined Kaiser Permanente in 2003. So let's uh, welcome Dr. Ha. Thank you so much for that uh, introduction, really for the invitation as well. This is the gentleman who has brought me here today. I really want to thank him for that effort to do, to do so. Uh, before I give a talk, anytime I give a talk, I always have to start with a few disclaimers, uh, just so we're on the same page. Number one, I am a physician with Kaiser Permanente, but everything, all my opinions that I express today are my own personal opinions. So if I say something today that doesn't quite uh, isn't quite cool with you. Don't go out here and say, oh, Kaiser Permanente said this, this, and this. It is Dr. Ha, who works for Kaiser Permanente, said this. Uh, the second thing is, uh, even though I am a physician, I need you to take what I say today as information and not medical advice, because I don't know your medical issues, what medications you're on, what issues you're dealing with. Um, so I want you to take this today as information, and then if you're interested uh, in pursuing making some changes, you may want to speak with your physician about what you're thinking about, so they can keep on top of things in case they need to adjust your medicines or decrease your medicines or even stop some of your medications. Uh, and the third thing is if I happen to mention a book, an article, a uh, documentary, you know, something, a resource, I have no financial interest 
in any of these resources. So it's not like I'm here to promote a book or promote you to watch something or buy something. Uh, I am simply here on my own time to share information with you. And I'm, I, there's no financial interest. I'm receiving no compensation for being here, okay? So let's start with a few facts that most of you probably already know. Uh, number one, three trillion dollars. So that's the amount the U.S. spends on healthcare every year, and the numbers only seem to be rising. That's actually about ten thousand dollars per every man, woman, and child that lives in the U.S. Ten thousand dollars per year. Uh, number two, two thirds of people in the U.S. are considered overweight or obese. It's based on their body mass index. Uh, one out of every ten person is diabetic. And it's projected that by 2050, one out of every three people will be diabetic in the US. One out of every three people is pre-diabetic. And it's, it's proposed that nine out of 10 people actually don't know that they're pre-diabetic because they've never been tested. Um, you know, these are just some of the, the, the facts that we're, we're facing here in the US, if not, not globally, because healthcare is a global issue and everyone is struggling. Um, life expectancy. In the US, you would expect with all the money we spend every year on healthcare that we should be at least be top 10, right? We're actually around 40th in the world uh, out of countries in terms of life expectancy. About 78 years is what most of us will get. Women, a little bit more than men. Women, about 82 years. Men, about 76. And if anything, life expectancy is actually dropping uh, in the US. So the, the question I have for you today is what, what is the answer to healthcare in America? And I came up with this title more as a way to try to draw people in, because whenever you talk about healthcare, it seems like such a boring topic for some people. Uh, but hopefully, this topic, this this uh, title, intrigues you a little bit. To really ask, you know, if not if not kale, what what is the answer to healthcare in America? Um, how many of you, how many of you here in the room would say you're already more plant based or plant centered in your eating habits? Okay, how many of you here are kind of omnivores? You kind of eat whatever you want, everything you want, anything and everything, about half the room, okay. All right, but how many of you are interested in the idea that perhaps the solution to health and healthcare in America is, is really a focus on nutrition? How many of you would believe or agree with that statement? But what if I change the word kale to is a whole food plant-based diet the answer to health in America? Would you be interested in that conversation? Yeah. Yeah. So let me start by really defining what a whole food plant-based diet is. Uh, but actually, before we get there, let me start by kind of just sharing my own personal, I guess, journey or testimony to how I came to this point uh, in my, my life, in my career. Hopefully, all of you picked up the handouts that were in the back of the room. One is a booklet called The Plant-Based Diet. Uh, one is just a little article I wrote for the Be Well magazine when Be Well was still around. So a couple of years ago. And then the last thing I have for you is just the, the first page of an article that was published recently in the Permanente Journal. I was fortunate to be a contributing author on the article. And if you're really interested in lifestyle medicine or that idea that lifestyle is the answer to health, I would encourage you to read this article because you will learn a tremendous amount uh, about health and, and medicine uh, just through this one article, okay? <clears throat> but if, if any of you read this one, uh, I kind of summarize a little bit kind of where, how I ended up at this point, but let me, let me take you back a few years, okay? Uh, so about, I guess it was about six years ago, uh, I received an email from one of my patients that I think is really the, the, the first step for me in the, embracing a healthier, healthier diet. So a patient of mine, Mr. Park, who I had been caring for for many years, sent me an email one day uh, telling me that he was having some blood in his urine. Now he was an older gentleman, probably I think in his 60s at the time. Um, again, I had been caring for him for many years. He had a lot of the common issues that we see in our patients. He had diabetes, high blood pressure, definitely sleep apnea, he was overweight. Um, and he really struggled with these issues for many, many years. So when he sent me this email saying that he was having blood in his urine, and being an older gentleman, I just figured, oh, maybe it's a kidney stone. Uh, oh, maybe it's a prostate issue. It's probably nothing serious. We'll, we'll figure it out. So I had him come into the office. We talked about it. And I said, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll take care of this. Let's order a CAT scan. Let's scan your kidneys. And let's see where that blood is coming from. Okay? 
So a few days later, he went in for the CAT scan and I got the results. What was really interesting was he didn't actually have anything in his kidneys. But what we found was there were, there were a lot of tumors in his liver and also in his pancreas. So he actually had pancreatic cancer. Um, and if any of you know pancreatic cancer, very difficult to diagnose early. Typically not a lot of symptoms until it's very advanced. Uh, and the prognosis is extremely poor. Um, so, you know, he came into the office with his wife. We had that challenging conversation that, you know, I actually don't think there's anything in your kidneys, but it looks like you have cancer. And at that point, I referred him to a cancer specialist to talk about you know, what, what were the options at that point. Uh, knowing that his, his time was limited, uh, he decided to forego any treatment because at this point it had already spread pretty aggressively. And he knew that treatment probably wasn't going to extend his time much more, and if anything, make him feel worse during the time that he had left. Um, so he actually decided to forego treatment completely, and about a few months later, he passed away. I wish I could tell you he went on a plant-based diet and it cured his pancreatic cancer, but that's, unfortunately, the story doesn't end that way. But was it really interesting, a few, a few months later, I think, this, I think I saw him in the spring and that fall, uh, his wife came in to see me. She was a patient of mine. Um, and through the whole process, she had a really hard time. As I'm sure any of you would have a hard time, this diagnosis comes out of the blue. You know, where did it come from? What caused it? Why? Yes, you ask yourself why. Um, and everything just happened so quickly. Within months, he was gone. Uh, and she, the first thing I noticed when she walked in the room is that she had, she had lost a lot of weight. And I just figured it was the stress of her husband's illness, the stress of going through everything. Um, and so to, towards the end of the visit, I kind of mentioned to her, I noticed she lost quite a bit of weight. Is everything okay? And what she told me was <clears throat> uh, she was fine, that you know, while after the diagnosis, she and her family became very interested in trying to figure out why this happened and what could any of them do to reduce the risk of having the same outcome of developing cancer. And if you just go on Google and you put in cancer and, and causes and nutrition, I'm sure you'll get tons and tons of hits. But what they came upon was a lot of inter interesting information about the role of nutrition in cancer that they had found very interesting. And she told me that her son, based on the information, had read a book called Eat to Live. Have any of you read the book Eat to Live by Dr. Furman? Okay, a few of you. Um, she told me that uh, based on the information they had read, her family as a whole, together had decided they were all going to try to move towards a more plant-based diet. And that was the reason she had lost all the weight. And obviously the stress contributed, but the dietary change had made a tremendous difference. And I think she had lost somewhere 20 to 30 pounds at that point. So as we were finishing up the visit, she, she looked at me and she said, Dr. Ha, I need you to do something for me. And I said, I said of course, what, what can I do for you? Anything. She said, I, I need you to read this book because since, since Robert was diagnosed through all the treatment and everything, no one has really been able to tell me why any of this happened. And even though Robert's gone, perhaps the information in this book could help someone else to not have to go through the same thing. Um, so I, I said, of course, you know, I'll read the book. I'll have to admit at the time, I wasn't really that interested in what you know, okay, it's a book. What, what am I going to learn from a book? Uh, but later, towards the holidays, I had a little bit of time. And to follow through my promise, I, I, I got a copy. And I started reading the book, Eat to Live. Um, and what I found really interesting was a lot of information seemed like common sense, but it was nothing that I had ever been taught before in college, in medical school, in training. No one had ever really emphasized to me the role that nutrition plays in health. And the fact that by embracing or focusing on healthy nutrition, perhaps we can eliminate or prevent a lot of the different issues that we see. When we talk about $3 trillion, there's an estimate that about 80% of that money is spent on conditions that are preventable. Chronic conditions such as diabetes, high blood pressure, stroke, even cancer to some extent. Now, you can't, obviously you can't cure everything, but your goal, if your goal is to really reduce your risk, if you're not having a conversation about nutrition, you're really not talking about what are some of the main drivers for your, your risk of all of these different diseases. So after reading Eat to Live, you know, I became much more interested, started researching on my own, found 
the documentary Forks Over Knives, and just from there, read the China study, and just on and on. All of this information that's out there, any of us have accessible to us, but most of it was new to me. And most of it I had never been taught. And if it had never been taught to me, how could I possibly teach that to my patients? So as with it, most of us, whenever you learn something new and you get excited about it, I kind of took this back to my practice and started talking to patients about nutrition, encouraging them to maybe give this a try because everything I had read, studies, et cetera, really pointed in the same direction. When you improve your, your nutrition, even if it's not 100%, you typically will see benefits. And that's exactly what I saw. The patients who for many years had been on lots of medicines, diabetic, on insulin, on other medicines, as they embraced a healthier diet, a lot of these conditions improved to the point where we could start taking away some of the medications. Um, so through that experience, just more and more, I became, became more interested and started researching and really encouraging my patients to be open to the concept. Uh, and let me, so let me start by defining for you, what is a whole food plant-based diet, okay? Because often when I, when I propose this to my patients and they hear what I have to say, they ask me, so you're asking me to become a vegan, is that what you're saying? And I always say no, and let me explain why. So a plant-based diet, a whole food plant-based diet means you really focus on intaking more uh, unprocessed foods, so things that are not like one thing changed into something else, and things that come from plants. So things that come from fruits, vegetables, whole grains, more beans, more lentils, and even tofu I would consider minimally processed. Okay? So fruits and vegetables, whole grains, beans. Those four things uh, really focus on eating more every day. And I think that's what you, you're having for lunch today, I believe. But there's really four things you should decrease, minimize, and for some people even eliminate, depending on your health status. Number one, dairy. Milk, cheese, yogurt, ice cream, butter. If you really think about it, even though I grew up drinking milk every day at school and milk, is, milk does the body good, um, if you really think about it, you know, humans are pretty much the only mammal in nature that drinks the milk of another mammal. Why, why would we do that? Other than it's a good source of nutrition, perhaps it has protein, perhaps it has calcium and other things. Uh, but if it's not absolutely necessary for your health and your development, why would you, you choose to drink milk because you enjoy it, not because it's good for you, okay? So dairy is number one. Number two is animal protein. And when I, when I say this to my patients, what I often hear is, I don't really eat meat, I only eat chicken and fish. And I, I always have to pause for a minute to ask, well, what do you define as meat? Most people refer to red meat. But what I'm telling you is eggs, fish, chicken, turkey, pork, beef, lamb, anything from an animal. Uh, there seems to be a, a potential link between animal protein and chronic diseases. As your intake of dairy and animal protein goes up, your rates of heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, cancer seem to rise with it, as well as obesity. Number three, processed foods. Chips, cookies, donuts, fruit juices, uh, energy drinks, uh, things we would consider junk food really should be kept to a minimum. And then number four would be oils and fried foods. Whenever you use a lot of oils in your cooking, you, you're using a lot of fat. You take an olive, you squeeze it, you get the olive oil, that's the fat out of the olive. You left behind a whole bunch of other stuff in the olive. And when you fry something <clears throat> at such high temperature, that can create issues as well. So you take a potato, which is actually pretty healthy for you, you cut it up and you fry it into a french fry, and now you've taken something that was healthy and you've turned it into something that's probably less healthy for you because of the process, the oils and the fat that get added, the calories that get added whenever you fry something. So I try to keep it really simple. If you, I, I call it kind of the rule of four. Four things you eat lots of every day, fruits and vegetables, whole grains, beans. Four things you eat less of every day, meat and dairy, processed foods, and oils and fried foods, okay? One thing I didn't mention was nuts and seeds. Uh, I think nuts and seeds are good for you. You can't overdo it. You, you know, living here in Kern County, nuts are everywhere. And it's easy to grab handfuls all the time every day. Uh, I would encourage you to keep nuts a small amount every day, but still incorporate them into your diet. Almonds, walnuts, chia seeds, flax seeds, these are things that are really good for your health, okay? So that's what I would define as a whole foods plant-based diet. Now, why is that not vegetarian or vegan? Well, when you, if you talk to someone and, they say, and you ask them, you know, what is your, what is your diet? And they say, oh, I'm a vegetarian. 
<clears throat> do you really know what that means? Some vegetarians eat fish, some eat eggs, some drink milk. The, the word vegetarian, there's lots of different possibilities or, or, or types of vegetarian. They're not all the same. But then you go to vegan and you say, well, isn't a vegan diet the healthiest? If you look around, if you go to any, any grocery store nowadays, you'll find lots of vegan junk food, vegan pizza, vegan donuts, vegan fake meats. And I'm not saying you can't consume those things, but you know, just because you're eating something that didn't come, from, that doesn't have anything in an animal in the food doesn't necessarily mean it's healthy. And you could live on beer, french fries, vegan pizza, and vegan donuts, but I wouldn't consider that healthy. Okay. But if you flip it and go back to what I said earlier, whole food plant-based. It's lots of minimally processed or unprocessed foods and everything that comes from a plant, fruits and vegetables, whole grains, beans, lentils, tofu. That should be the bulk of what you eat every day. If you look in the pamphlet, that's what you'll see kind of as recommendations with lots of different uh, variations of that, okay? And one thing that's really challenging is, if a lot of my patients come in and they say, Doc, okay, I, I get it, I hear what you're saying, but just tell me what to eat. Tell me what to eat. And what I often tell them is, I can't tell you what to eat. Because all of us grew up eating different things. What I grew up eating every day probably looks nothing like what you grew up eating every day. How can I tell you you have to eat these foods that have no bearing to you culturally or you know, socially? How can I force that on you? But if you do the research, what you'll find is cultures throughout the world, especially those that live long, healthy lives, they're, they tend to be very much plant-based, plant-centered. Lots of fruits, lots of vegetables, lots of grains, lots of beans. There's even a book out there called Blue Zones. There was a journalist, Dan Buettner, who worked for National Geographic. And he traveled the world looking for populations that lived to be 100 and healthy. And his job was to kind of look through those populations to see what were the common characteristics you would find among all these different groups. Because they're scattered throughout the world. The closest one to us being the Seventh-day Adventists. And Loma Linda, they're considered a blue zone because they tend to have longevity. There's lots of different factors. You know, do you have a purpose in life? Do you have a strong social network? Do you tend to be active every day? But one of the consistents was around nutrition was they're predominantly plant-based. It doesn't mean they never eat meat or never consume dairy, but it's, it tends to be very little of what they consume on a regular basis. Some processed foods are extremely kept to a minimum. And what we see around the world is as more countries become uh, more westernized or embrace a more western diet, you start to see the rise of all the different issues that we're dealing with here in the US. So high blood pressure, the obesity, the diabetes, the heart disease, the strokes, the dialysis, all the things that contribute to the three trillion dollars we spend every year on health care. But if you go back generations and you look at the people who, uh, who lived eating more plant-based, they tend to be the ones that live longer, healthier lives, okay? So that kind of defines what a whole food plant-based diet is. Really four things you eat lots of every day, four things you keep to a minimum or reduce. Now, how far should you go? Uh, me personally, I, there's no hard and fast rule here, but I try to keep my, my meat and dairy intake to about two meals a week. Uh, and when I do consume it, I keep it to a minimum. I'm not eating you know, as much as I used to in the past. Growing, growing up in North Carolina, with barbecue and, and pig pickings and all those things, you know, meat was the basis of every meal. Most, what I eat every day looks a lot different now. Um, if you have chronic issues though, if you're diabetic, you have high blood pressure, you're struggling with other health issues, in the beginning, I would push you a little bit harder to really try and move towards closer to 100%, because what happens is, as you get closer to 100%, typically you start to see the benefits very quickly. And when you start to feel different, feel better, feel healthier, that often encourages you to go a little further. Now that doesn't work for everyone. For some people, a gradual transition is much more uh, uh, doable and sustainable in the long run. But you have to figure out what is your, your, what is your personality, what works for you. Does going 100% for a few weeks work for you? Or does kind of gradually moving down to eating more meatless meals every week? Which one works best for you? Okay, now I'm gonna leave a lot of time for questions at the end, but I wanna just make sure we're all on the same page. Any questions about anything I've said so far? Yes. Healthy oils. Okay, yeah.
Yeah. So, you know, so actual oils, I would keep to a minimum. Even canola, avocado, coconut oil, I don't consider healthy. So there's been a big push recently for coconut oil. Put coconut oil in your, in your coffee. Cook everything with coconut oil. I wouldn't recommend it because coconut oil is fairly high in saturated fat. Uh, fat naturally found in nuts, avocados, uh, some vegetables. That's what I would push you towards. And that's, if you look in the booklet, they kind of list some sources of healthy fat. Now, does that mean I never eat something that's fried or never cook a little bit of oil? No, I still do sometimes, but I keep it to a minimum. And I only use just the, the, the least amount possible. Olive oil as well. I know Medi the Mediterranean diet is often promoted as the healthiest diet. But what you'll find in studies is even people on the Mediterranean diet have heart attacks and strokes. So if you're trying to further reduce your risk of ever having a heart attack or a stroke, you should probably push a little further and not just eat, quote, Mediterranean, but cutting back on fish, oils, is probably something else I would do. Yeah. Sounds a little aggressive, right? Yes. Pesticides. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I often get this question when I, I do a free workshop every month at Kaiser Permanente, the second Sunday of every month. Um, pesticides. So there definitely are certain fruits or vegetables that tend to have higher amounts of pesticides. Uh, if you go on the, if you go online, <clears throat> there's a group called the Environmental Working Group, and they tend to list the dirty dozen. I think the 12 fruits and vegetables that tend to have the most pesticides. And I think they have like the clean 15. So maybe when you're choosing certain fruits and vegetables, if they're on the dirty dozen, you would choose more organic. But there's a lots of fruits and vegetables that, that don't really use a lot of pesticides because they're hardy and they don't really need them. So I would use that kind of as a guide. That being said, we all have heard eating healthy is too expensive. Okay, so does everything have to be organic or fresh or from the farmer's market? I would say no, absolutely not. Um, conventional produce, I think it can be just as healthy. It's really about what you're eating more of and what you're eating less of. Because if you think about it, even meat and dairy, and let's think about what are the animals fed every day? Corn, soy, other things, are they being given antibiotics, growth hormones? Whatever the animal takes in ends up in their flesh. So when you consume them, you probably are consuming some of what they have consumed. And if you're not, so if you're going to continue eating meat and dairy, probably choosing organic, I mean, that type of thing is probably healthier for you. But really, I don't want the idea that you have to eat everything organic to be the barrier to you eating healthier. Now, apples, I think, are considered one of the high pesticides fruits. I wouldn't encourage you not to eat apples if they're not organic. Maybe peel it and then eat it. But it's still better off to eat the apple than the bag of chips. Okay? True? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, first the library, if any of you, when you were sitting in a library, the library is a great resource, but online, Facebook, just Google family friendly plant-based eating plans. Um, one, of the, one of the best things you can do is keep whatever you have at home healthy. I mean, we all know if you have ice cream in the freezer, you have chips in the pantry, you have soda in the fridge, eventually it's going to get consumed. But if you simply don't have those things at home and you replace them with lots of cut up fruit, different vegetables, healthier options, kids, they're not gonna starve themselves. They'll, they'll eat something. And if what you have at home is healthy, it makes it easier for them. Same thing goes for adults as well though. I mean, how many times have you had an evening where you have the munchies and you go back and forth to the pantry five times before you finally give in and say, I'm just gonna eat the chips. I, I know I shouldn't, I'm just gonna eat them. Part of it is willpower. The more times you have to say no, the harder it gets to say no. So if you have a bag of a jar of candy on the counter at work, and every day you pass that jar of candy, and every time you pass it, you have to deny yourself, eventually you're just gonna give in because you get tired of saying no. And that's just human nature. But if you change your environment, you have healthier options at home, and you make that sort of a go-to snack or meal, it makes it much easier. And then look again, looking up uh, recipes, websites. Um, Forks Over Knives has a really great website, tons of recipes. 
not too complicated. Uh, and if you look on the if you look in the booklet, <clears throat> I think I've listed the website in the back. Uh, if you have Netflix, Forks Over Knives is on Netflix. And there's another one called What the Health that I encourage my patients to watch. For some people, it's a little bit more eye-opening, and maybe some of the things they say are a little controversial. But I think it's just information. Take it for what it is. It's information, and make the, make choices based on the information you receive. Okay. But um, yeah, Forks Over Knives has a really great website. Tons of recipes, lots of different you know, ethnic cuisines as well. And one thing I consistently hear from my patients is when they start trying to eat more plant-based, they find that they're, they become more open to trying new things, different ethnic foods, different spices, different dishes they've never tried before. And what they discover is there's this whole world of food out there they've never, they've never known. So hopefully, if you have a little bit of an adventurous palate, you're willing to try some new things, maybe some things that you're not used to eating all the time, but would be open to trying, I would say go for it. And you'll, you'll probably find, you know, three, five, seven different types of meals that you really enjoy, that you feel comfortable making, and put that in your weekly rotation. And then depending on where you are on your journey with this, if you're not 100%, make that one or two meals where you go out, have a little something or whatever it is you want, you make that your, I don't know what to call it reward, but make that kind of your 10%. Because I think in studies what we see is, when you keep your intake of meat, dairy, processed foods, and, and those things to about 10% of your intake, th there seems to be a, a benefit there. Once you start moving beyond 10%, that's when you start seeing an increase in issues. So do you have to figure out where you are, where you want to be? And if anything, why do you want to make a change? I mean, how many of you in the room have seen friends, colleagues, relatives suffer from a chronic illness, like diabetes, high blood pressure, um, amputation, heart attack, out of nowhere, stroke. I mean, I think when it really comes down to it, you know, sure, we all want to be healthier, we all, all want to live longer. Because that's such a distant goal, that sometimes isn't enough motivation for you to make a change today. But if you really sit down and define for yourself what's important to you, how you want to live your life, whether you ever want to suffer with any of these issues, Make that your why, why you want to make a change. What is your motivation and what's going to sustain you? Because the world around you is not built to eat this way. I mean, how easy is it for, for you to walk over to the student center uh, and eat something that tastes really good but may not be the healthiest for you? And how much harder might it be for you to find an option that would be a healthier choice that you would consider affordable and actually enjoyable? But as you become more aware of the information as to the reasoning why, the, the medical, medical basis, the scientific reason why this may be a healthier choice for you, hopefully that will encourage you to make those better choices even when you're faced with the difficult decision. Okay? I'm, gonna, I'm gonna kind of open it up for questions because I, I enjoy hearing myself talk, but not that much. So please share, what, what questions do you have for me today about anything I've said so far or other, other topics? Yes. Uh, Calorie-wise, nuts are very high in fat <clears throat> in calories. So for some of my patients, as they transition to a more plant-based diet, they, they have trouble losing weight. They say, I'm eating healthy, but my weight's not going anywhere. And I ask them, well, how many nuts are you eating a day? And they say, well, I'm eating pistachios and almonds and all these bars and things. And I say, well, you know, nuts, think about it, a nut really is, contains everything to become a tree. I mean, there's lots of nutrition in there. <laughs> And maybe you don't need all that nutrition in that much, in that quantity. So cutting back a little bit on nuts can be helpful. But we do know that, you know, walnuts, almonds. Um, I, eat, I eat one Brazil nut a week. There was a very small study that said one Brazil nut a week potentially could lower your cholesterol. So one Brazil nut a week. Don't, don't do it like every day because it's high in selenium and other things. Because that's the other thing. People often say, well, you know, if it's good for me, then a lot of it must be really good for me. So we take a lot of supplements and vitamins and we, we mega load on vitamin C and E. I don't think there's any basis for that. And if you think about it, if you think about the chemistry of your, of your body, your physiology, you know, you, your, your body runs on just the right amount. Anytime you overload a system with too much of one thing, it can create other issues in other places. Um, so I wouldn't encourage you to think that just by taking mega doses of supplements and vitamins, that's going to replace you actually eating healthier. It really isn't. 
And if anything, high doses of X, Y, and Z could actually be dangerous to you and contribute to other problems. Okay? Does that answer your question? Okay, okay great. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Absolutely. And that's a very common question. And that's, that's one of the first um, questions I get when I talk to my patients about this. Well, how do you get enough protein every day? And I guess my, what I often tell people is in all my years in practice, I've yet to see someone protein deficient. If you, if you live in the U.S. and you eat food, you're getting enough protein. Um, we actually probably get more protein than we really need. I mean, the recommendations around protein requirements are really based on men who are working out in the industry, really laborious, physical labor. So when they came out with, quote, the requirements, we were basing it on that level of activity. But there really wasn't a whole lot more to it. If anything, most of us are protein overloaded. And excess protein, especially animal protein, is very hard on the kidney. Let's think about it, though. Think about some of the largest animals in nature, the elephant, the rhino, the gorilla. What do they eat? Plants. Where do they get their protein? Plants. Where do we get our protein? By eating the animals, they eat the plants. So if you go around the animal and you eat the plant, you're going straight to the source versus eating the intermediary. So I would encourage you not to worry about protein. Some people end up buying protein supplements and protein shakes and protein fortified everything. And if you just eat fruits and vegetables, whole grains and beans, you're getting all the protein you need. Um, what I tell my patients most often is this. It's not so much how much you eat, it's what you eat every day that matters. Because if you eat fruits and vegetables, whole grain and beans, naturally your caloric intake is going to be lower than if you're eating lots of meat and dairy, processed foods, and sugars. You actually will have to eat more food to sustain the same calorie intake. And it's really difficult to do. I mean, a head of broccoli, most of us couldn't sit down and eat a whole head of broccoli, but it probably has 60, 80 calories. A pat of butter has 150. And think about it. Um, so the, the protein question, we get it a lot. I mean, if you're an, if you're an elite athlete, training you may need more because your, your, your caloric intake is going to be higher. For, for, but for most common people like me, there's no need to supplement to focus on getting more protein every day. Now, a lot of people also say, well, if I don't eat protein, I'm going to be hungry all the time. And I tell them, well, you're probably just not eating enough. Because again, calorically, if you're eating lots of fruit and vegetables, whole grain and beans, calorically, those foods are just not as dense. They are higher in fiber, but they're not as dense. So your body is going to kind of go through it pretty quickly. And you may have to eat more often, or eat larger quantities, but you're not going to become protein deficient. Okay? You got a question? Okay? Yeah, yeah, I've heard that approach. You know, multiple meals, multiple small meals to keep your metabolism going. I mean, let's face it, who has time to eat five meals a day? I don't. I can't imagine you do. I think just eat. If you're hungry, eat something. Eat a banana, eat an apple, eat some cucumbers, a carrot, celery, eat some rice and beans. Eat something. Don't feel like you can't eat. Fine. If, you, if, you, <laughs> if you're satisfied eating two meals a day and you physically feel good and you're not suffering with medical issues, fine. Now, the only two things... I do take as a supplement. One is vitamin B12. Because if you're, if you're completely vegan, nothing from an animal, you may become B12 deficient. So taking some B12 either daily, 1,000 micrograms once a day, or 2,500 once a week, that would be adequate to keep your B12 levels up. Uh, as you get older, you may want to definitely take it because your absorption goes down. 
But vitamin D is another one. A lot of patients, because we don't spend as much time in the sun, we're moving into the winter months, vitamin D may be something else you want to consider taking. I take about 2,000 units a day. That's in studies it's been shown to kind of keep your levels where they need to be. I don't think that's too much to take. So these are kind of the two things I would take. Other than that, if you're eating a nice variety of fruits and vegetables, different colors, different types, you're going to be okay. Does that answer your question? Okay. Fish. Yeah. Okay, so people come to me and they say, well, what about, I hear this a lot, what about fish? Should, isn't fish good for you? Isn't it good for your heart? So a couple things. Um, one, it is animal protein and it is animal fat. As you increase your intake of animal protein and fat, one of the main things you're putting yourself at risk for is diabetes. So there's a lot of evidence that even eating fish or eggs once a week, your risk of diabetes will go up compared to someone who doesn't consume them at all. Okay? So I tell people, eat fish because you like it, not because you think it's good for you. All right? Everyone's on salmon. I eat lots of salmon. Salmon, salmon, salmon. Salmon has a lot of fat and it's animal protein. And if you think about it, are our oceans as clean as they were 50 years ago? And when the big fish eat the little fish, and the little fish are accumulating stuff from the ocean, and the big fish eat them, what are you doing? You're accumulating all that stuff into the bigger fish, which we then eat. So I can't tell you it's completely unsafe to eat fish. I still eat it once in a while. But eat it because you enjoy it not because you think it's good for you, or it's necessarily a better option than chicken or fish, or chicken or turkey, whatever. Um, going back to diabetes, why is, why is animal protein such a risk factor for diabetes? And let me try to explain this to you. Um, type 2 diabetes, which is what the, most people have in this country, is something that we, we typically see in older patients. But we're actually starting to see it in younger and younger patients, in their 20s, even in their teens. We're starting to see people develop diabetes that we would never have seen in these individuals 20, 30 years ago. So what's the problem? And why is animal protein such a risk factor? When you think of type 2, type 1 diabetes is typically when your pancreas just does stop working completely. And without insulin shots, you wouldn't survive. Because insulin is, insulin is what your pancreas makes. It helps your body bring the sugar out of the bloodstream into your muscles and other cells so you can use it for energy. Okay. So insulin is extremely important. But in type 2 diabetes, you, you have essentially become insulin resistant. You eat something, you eat an apple, your body breaks it down to sugar, your blood sugar goes up, your pancreas still releases insulin, but insulin doesn't quite work the way it should. It cannot open the cells in the body, so the sugar leaves the bloodstream and goes into the cells, your muscles and other places, so you can use it for energy. Therefore, your blood sugar stays high, and that's what we find with diabetes. So why is animal protein such a risk factor? Well, as you intake more animal protein and fat, your cells become more resistant to insulin. It's part of it, the thought is the fat that you consume gets clogs up the cells, so the insulin receptors aren't as responsive to insulin, so the glucose transport mechanism doesn't work. There's also other things. I don't want to make it too simplified, but animal protein and fat seems to be a main driver. But there's other things. The heme iron in meat is thought to be an issue. Animal protein is thought to be anti-inflammatory in the body. No, I'm sorry, not anti-inflammatory, but inflammatory. So there's this idea that inflammation within the body also contributes to chronic diseases like diabetes, heart disease, etc. So as you reduce your intake of animal protein and animal fat, along with cutting back on processed sugars and oils and those things, your body tends to become insulin, less insulin resistant more insulin sensitive, and your need for insulin goes down. Because when we think about diabetes, <clears throat> all the different medicines I can give you for diabetes doesn't actually fix the problem. It doesn't actually fix the issue of insulin resistance. It does other things, but it doesn't fix the insulin resistance. So whenever I have patients come to me with diabetes, and we talk about diabetes, I explain to them exactly what I told you. It's not so much carbs and sugar, it's really animal protein and fat that I want you to reduce. And when you do that, typically your blood sugar starts to improve. But cutting back or cutting out eggs, fish, chicken, dairy, cheese, butter, yogurt, ice cream, cream in your coffee, these are the things I would encourage you to cut out immediately 
but try to get your body more sensitive to insulin again so your blood sugar can go down and we can actually cut back on medication. I've been successful with a few of my patients cutting back or even eliminating their need for insulin. I mean, how many of you would like to give yourself a shot of insulin every day for the rest of your life if you, if you didn't have to? Who would prefer to do that every single day instead of maybe just eating healthier? The challenge is though, not everyone is, not everyone gets that explanation of diabetes. I mean, how many of you have heard that explanation before? Any of you? you? Where did you hear it? YouTube. Was it a plant-based person or? Yeah. I mean, if, you watch, if you watch What the Hell, <clears throat> they kind of go through that explanation. Um, and, and again, some people say, well, you know what? It's, diabetes is not that simple. You can't just be the fat. I mean, that's, you're, you can't just tell people that's the problem and expect them that to fix it. And here, I'm here to tell you it's not, it really isn't that simple, but it's a huge step in the right direction. As you start to increase, I'm sorry, decrease your intake of meat and dairy, processed foods, and oils, you start to shed some of the fat, you become more insulin sensitive, and your blood sugars improve the way they should. Now, just this morning, I saw a gentleman I've been working with for about two weeks, and he came to me on two twice a day long acting insulin, as well as insulin before every meal. <clears throat> and he weighs, I don't know, 350 pounds. And he's been on this regimen for a really long time. And I, we sat down, we talked about this two weeks ago, and I explained to him exactly what I told you today. And I said, are you interested in giving this a try? And he said, yes. So I immediately stopped his morning insulin. I, I took away the mealtime insulin. I added a second oral medication I thought would be beneficial along with his metformin, which is a pretty much a mainstay for diabetes treatment. And I reduced his bedtime insulin by about 20%. So even with a reduction in his medicines, in over two weeks, he's dropped over 20 pounds, and his blood sugar is coming down on less insulin, and he feels better. And so when I saw him today, he and I were both really encouraged about the progress he's made, and he's really excited about the possibility. Is it possible at some point they could actually stop using insulin? And that's kind of his goal now. Because here's part of the problem as well. Insulin works. So if, you take, if you're diabetic and your body has trouble bringing your blood sugars down, we have you on pills and it's not enough, putting you on insulin works. It will bring your blood sugars down. But what typically happens? Your weight goes up. You typically gain 5, 10, 15, 20 pounds. A lot of it's fat. Because where is all that sugar going? Going into your fat cells. And you actually become more overweight or obese, which may actually drive your insulin resistance more that you need more insulin. And it's just kind of this vicious cycle that happens where people get hopeless because they're like, I'm, I'm doing everything you told me, doc. I'm giving myself the injections, nothing's working. Why even, why even bother? But when you think about it, if you take the explanation I gave you today, and if you go home and you have a friend or a colleague or someone who's diabetic and they're struggling with their sugars and they're on insulin, their, their A1C, which is how we measure diabetes control or diagnose diabetes is not where it needs to be, Maybe encourage them to think about kind of this idea, at least research and think about it. Because ultimately, I don't want you to, I don't want any of you to leave here today and do this just because I told you. I would rather you go out there, read it, think about it, research it, and really convince yourself that it's the right thing for you, it's the right thing for your family, and it's the right thing for you to really meet your goals in life, whatever it is your goals are. I'm assuming most of us would like to be around for a while, live a long, healthy life instead of a long life and just kind of exist towards the end, which is unfortunately what we sometimes see with our patients who, are, who have struggled with chronic diseases their whole life. And I'm, I'm definitely not here to say this is the cure-all. I, mean, I wish I could say kale is the answer to healthcare in America. Um, but I would have to say, I was thinking about this, people who eat kale on a regular basis probably are more plant-based, plant-centered than people who don't. So in the, when it comes down to it, maybe kale is the answer to help in America. Other questions before, before we finish up? Yeah. Fruit and sugar. So should we avoid fruit because it has sugars? No. Uh, I, will, I will say pretty much no one has become diabetic because of eating too much fruit. You eat too much fruit along with a lot of meat and dairy and other stuff, 
yes, you're going to have problems. But people who eat lots of fruit and vegetables and whole grains and beans actually have a much lower risk of diabetes than people who don't. So people who are diabetic often come to me and say, Doc, I can't eat fruit because there's just too much sugar. And I say, well, I'd rather you eat more fruit and less meat and dairy. That's going to help your sugar more than just avoiding the fruit. Because when you talk about the keto diet, the Atkins diet, if your goal is to lose weight, sure, you can go keto or Atkins, and you will lose weight, definitely. But is it sustainable? And can you just eat animal protein every day for the rest of your life? Most people can't. And in the end, most people just yo-yo back to where they started, and they're frustrated because they lost the weight, but it came right back. I think if you move to a more whole food plant-based diet and you really push towards 80, 90, 100%, it's not about how much you're eating. It's really what you're eating every day. And I want you to think about that. You know, people are successful losing weight by eating less. Calorie control, portion control. That's really what Weight Watchers is built around. Counting points, watching your intake. And you can be successful with calorie control. But it's really easy once you stop counting to add back a couple hundred calories every day. A snack here, a drink there. Before you know it, the weight just kind of comes back. But when you really focus on eating foods that naturally are lower in calories, fruits, vegetables, grains, and beans, and you really minimize the high fat, high calorie foods, the meat, the dairies, the processed foods, and the fried foods, naturally you're controlling your calories without even trying. And the weight tends to come off. And if you're really doing it 100% and you're not seeing the benefits or seeing the results, speak to your doctor. Try to figure out what it might be. Maybe it's too many nuts. And maybe it's that plant-based smoothie every morning that's like a thousand calories and you drink it in, in, in three minutes and two hours later you're hungry again. Maybe if you had taken all those fruits and vegetables and things you put in the smoothie and tried to eat them all, you probably couldn't do it. But when you blend it up and you drink it, it just goes straight through. Okay? So there's little things like this that can trip people up. But as long as you're moving in that direction, my guess is you're going to benefit. Okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, that's a, it's a complicated question. I would, I would have to argue that the food we eat today looks a lot different than the food we ate 25, 30 years ago. I don't really know how to, how to answer that. I think at a, at a cellular level, perhaps, the way that food is being produced, genetic engineering, genetic modification could have an impact. But beyond that, I think just what we're eating is more important than those minor modifications. So do I think that GMO, all GMO is bad? Probably not. Um, but if you're eating meat and dairy, you know, that chicken that you're eating, and that, that chicken was probably modified as well to grow much faster than it normally would, to develop much bigger you know, muscles so they can bring it in, and produce it much faster. So really everything is kind of modified. Getting back to just basics is probably where I would start. Um, and that's a complicated question. I, mean, I, I, I would have to say definitely the more, the more things we do to our food to change it and process it and add things and take things away, we just don't know how the body handles it. But I think it's, that if you, it's the daily impact of eating these types of foods every single day in large quantities. That cumulative effect, I think, is where we run into problems. Uh, because again, I'm not here to say you can never eat meat, never eat dairy, never eat a french fry, never eat a piece of pizza. But I'm saying in your overall intake day to day, week to week, that should probably be a much smaller percentage of what you consume. And a much larger percentage should be the fruits, the vegetables, the grains, the beans, no matter how they're produced. In the long run, I think you're going to benefit from doing that. Any, yes, we'll, we'll make this the last question. What are the dairy alternatives? Soy milk, almond milk, cashew milk, flaxseed milk. Those are okay. Now be careful. Some of them do have a lot of oils, other things in it to give it the texture and those types of things to try to resemble dairy. But ultimately, I think unsweetened almond, soy, that type of thing would be a good alternative. And that's what I've moved to. I mean, if you think about it, 70-80% uh, of people actually are lactose intolerant. We actually cannot digest lactose very easily. So a lot of people who come to me with IBS, 
cramping, bloating, gas. One of the first things I told them is, well, let's cut out the dairy and see what happens. And sometimes it helps tremendously. Okay. I really want to thank you for being here today. I hope you enjoyed the talk. I'm going to be around for a little while. If you have some other questions you'd like to come up and chat about, I'm happy to stick around for a while. Um, but if you enjoyed this, if you're interested in learning more, you know, again, I, I do offer a free workshop at Kaiser Permanente on the second Sunday of every month from 11.30 to 1.30. If you follow Kaiser Permanente Kern County on Facebook or Twitter, you often will post a reminder that these sessions are upcoming. And it's a lot of the same conversation we're having today, just about the benefits of all of us moving towards a more whole food, plant-based diet. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. That was great. Uh, thank you very much. The uh, just uh, keep in mind our our uh, mindfulness workshop will be coming up in October, and if you go to the uh, library webpage, you can see all our events, upcoming events. Also, uh, I believe there's more food back there, right? And I wanted to thank Eileen Montoya, in, right woman sitting right there, for getting the food here. And again, better bowls for you know, helping us out, sponsoring this, so thank you.